the sacrifice of the strong for the sake of the weak is not pathetic or weak. It is, in fact, the most glorious thing you can do. And if you, if you press into that enough, I think you'll find a man hanging on a cross, and you might even find yourself saying, Jesus is Lord. The two stories we live by in the secular West are utterly contradictory. The two stories go like this. Um, we are biological survival machines clinging to an insignificant rock, hurtling through a meaningless universe to a, towards eternal extinction. And Vladimir Putin is wrong. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. Well, today on the show, we're talking again with Glenn Scrivener, author of The Air We Breathe. Uh, you can find out more about him from the links with today's show and, and the book, too. Um, and one of the fascinating areas uh, that you cover is compassion, Glenn. We're going to be talking about why you believe Christianity really gave us our modern conception of compassion. Uh, again, uh, uh, many secular people, humanists and so on might say, well, look, of course, compassion, it's its a natural thing, you know, and it's bred of the fact that we are social creatures. Um, and, you know, when we see someone else suffering, uh, it's a kind of natural biological impulse to want to help because uh, we we're empathizing with them. We know what it's like. Uh, perhaps there's a kind of group evolutionary dynamic going on and so on. Uh, essentially, they're saying, you know, compassion isn't something you need god or religion to explain it's kind of it's it's there in the kind of dynamics of what it is to be a human basically so firstly what's your response to that kind of view of of where compassion comes from and then we'll get into sort of why you actually think it's got a very specific basis in the way we understand it in in the christian story yeah i mean obviously it is worth your while to be pro-social in your behavior and lots of evolutionary biologists have pointed out that it will give you an evolutionary advantage if you um, if you treat others in your tribe well you know chimpanzees who simply rule and dominate um, their tribe end up getting torn to pieces they might be the biggest you know chimp in the tribe but two others or three others who want to take them down can take them down and so it is worth that chimpanzee um, you know picking nits off others and being pro-social in in the behaviors that that chimpanzee displays because that will actually help that chimp to compete and get a mate and pass on their genes so um, i've got no problem with saying um there is there are certain kinds of pro-social behavior that are um, incentivized by the evolutionary process um, but whenever you're cooperating in this evolutionary paradigm you're cooperating in order to compete and it's always you know it's always me and my inner circle against those guys out there and actually the competition element um, does reign supreme Cooperation is only ever favored to the degree that it helps you compete. Compete with who? Compete with the, the weaker members of your species. And so it, it is just true that the evolutionary process favors the survival of the fittest. That does not necessarily mean the survival of the brawniest and the, you know, the, the most caveman-like member of the species. It could be the cleverest. Um, it could be the fastest. Who, who knows what it, what it means? But... Um, it does mean survival of the fittest. And then there is a, a, a ruthless winnowing of the weakest, therefore. If that is what nature does, then Jesus Christ comes along and he does the absolute opposite of that. He is the fittest who himself is sacrificed so that we, the weakest, might survive. He perishes, even though he's the fittest. We, though we are unworthy, are those who are the objects of his love and compassion that, that we might be, be raised up. That gives you uh, an ethic that is not natural. It is, in fact, supernatural. And so in my chapter on compassion, I, I just want to press into people's, um, people's intuitions that the sacrifice of the strong for the sake of the weak is not pathetic or weak. It is, in fact, the most glorious thing you can do. And if you, if you press into that enough, I think you'll find a man hanging on a cross, and you might even find yourself saying, Jesus is Lord. I think, it's, I think, I think the, the argument from compassion is that powerful, that 
it is uniquely given to us by Jesus. And when we press into compassion in the way that Jesus has taught us, I think we find ourselves at the foot of the cross, looking up at, at the one on the cross, like the centurion, this Roman centurion full of, of might and power, saying, surely this man was the son of God. I suppose um, contrast is often the, the, you know, the mother of clarity. And to, to some extent, I think because we're so immersed in a culture where it's just taken for granted that we, we you know, we give, uh, we, we're compassionate, you know, we, we, we look after people who are down on their luck or are ill or whatever. Um, it's kind of just, you know, we, it's the, the air we breathe, you know, as, as the, the title of the book says. Just give us the contrast, though, with, with what the picture would have looked like in, say, the first century, the, the time when Jesus was around, the, the kind of the Roman, Greek, pagan, classical culture. Because this wasn't a given by any means, was it, that we, that we treat the weak with honour and compassion and, and, and everything else. So, so give us a sense of what it looked like in that day and age, uh, if there was a, an ethic of compassion, who was it shown to and that kind of thing. Yeah, so... Um if you were a rich nobleman in Rome, um, you might give money for a, a monument to be made, or you might give money. Um, you, I mean, you might give the, the masses bread and circuses, um, and and then you're you're a bit of a hero. But um, you're a bit of a hero because that that is the goal of it. There is a, a display of your. You know, your magnificence and, and a, a, a display of um, your clemency, your mercy. Um, but it is absolutely the assertion of your social standing. And what, what just was not there in the ancient world were things like hospitals. Um, you know, the, the, there were sick bays for the army because you wanted to return your soldier back to fighting fitness. There were sick bays for your slaves, because once again, you want to restore your slave back to economic utility. Um, there, there just wasn't the sense of um, you care for the poor and the lame and the despised. And I, and I think, you know, one of the starkest ways of seeing this, this clash of views is to look at the very first depiction of crucifixion. The very first depiction of the crucifixion is um, it's scratched into the uh, into a plaster wall on the Palatine Hill. You can go to the Palatine Hill Museum right now. It's right right by the Colosseum in Rome, and it's got a, a picture of a figure on a cross who is Christ, and that figure has the head of a donkey. Because what kind of God shows up on a cross? It's, this is ridiculous. This is the slave's death. This is the most shameful thing you could do. Christ is a donkey, basically. But there's a worshipper at the foot of the cross, and he's raising his hand in veneration to Christ. And the caption just says it all. It says, Alex Samanos worships his God. And I think it's, it's really hard for comedy to hold up over the years, but I think the satire still bites 2,000 years later. It's like, what? It is asinine to, to worship a God on a cross. And yet, in this clash of cultures... It's those who worshipped the God on the cross that ended up taking over the Roman Empire and then taking over the world. Um, and I, I often just think of on that cross, at either end of the spear that the soldier was thrusting up into Jesus' side, you have two different visions of greatness. And obviously the centurion is an agent of Roman power and might. And that, that was the kind of greatness that a Roman would identify with. He has, he has the power of life or death. And so surely it is, it is great to be able to crush the weak who, you know, Jesus was seditious and he was, you know, he was claiming that there was another king, not Caesar. So there's that vision of greatness. But you travel along the spear and on the other end of that Roman spear, there is a very different vision of greatness and it's the greatness of sacrificial love how have we gotten to actually look at him on the cross and think to ourselves that is glory that is divine that that is not asinine that is actually our truest picture of god i think meditating on that image for the last 2000 years has has built a people who 
Now, when we see a cross, we're like, oh, that must mean a first aid um, box. Or something. It, it, it's a sign for first aid. It's a sign for an ambulance. It's a sign for a hospital. This is where I'm going to get help. And the reason why we make that association is, is because we have been shaped by the cross to the point where greatness is expressed in service. Glory is ex expressed in stooping sacrificial love. And it, it has formed us so profoundly that we now think that compassion is universal and obvious and basic, and, and it's nothing of the, of the, of the sort. Um, so, yeah. T t tell us about the example of the practice of what was sometimes called exposure, um, mm. because a lot of people would just simply be unfamiliar with some of the practices that now will seem utterly barbaric to us, but were just part of the norm then. Um, there's some fascinating letters I know, for instance, from there's one famous one of a, a Roman soldier away back to his wife um, talking about what to do if the child she's bearing happens to be a girl. Right. Just ex describe that letter, describe this practice, and, and then maybe that, that will, again, help us to see just how much our our views have changed and the way that Christians actually stepped in and started to change those those views. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, reeled off in this letter that's an affectionate letter from a husband to a wife. He is off at war and he's like, he's just saying things like, oh, and you might want to sell the top field, you know, before the springtime. And you know, like, it's, it's very domestic. It's very ordinary. Oh, and I know that you're pregnant. If it's a girl, expose. If it's a boy, keep it. And then he, he just moves on in the letter, and it's just absolutely casual. Um, and, of course, we hear that, and our modern sensibilities are, like, we're outraged. And I just think, well, just listen to that outrage. That is your Christianity talking. For those who don't know what it is, what, what did he mean by expose it? Because with that, that alone, yeah. that term may, may, we may not be familiar with. Right. And the fact that we're not familiar with it is another sign of the Christian revolution. Um, it has been a human universe. Infant infanticide is pretty much a human universal. Um, killing children. So you, you take a child and you expose it. Just You just leave it to die on a rubbish dump or you drown it or you throw it down a well or um, di different ways of killing off children. And overwhelmingly, you kill off um, girls and the disabled. Um, and... Um, you know, I've seen some estimates that in Rome there are about 130 men for every 100 women, whereas in the church it was the other way around, about 130 women for every 100 men. Um, but in, in Roman society, um, absolutely, um, girls were less economically useful to you, so why not Why not kill them off? And, and as I say, it was a universal practice. The, the Jews did not do it. Tacitus does record that, the, that there is... Um, uh, some Germanic tribes that do not practice exposure. They don't kill off, um, you know, children who are surplus to requirements. But that, but, but it's noteworthy for Tacitus. What, they, they don't kill their infant? They don't practice infanticide? So in, infanticide and, and, and even abortion was um, far more common than you'd think, especially when you understand you know, a, a first century practice of it would have been incredibly, incredibly dangerous, not only for the child, but also for the woman. And yet that was that was accepted, as was infanticide. And the Jews had always been against it, and, and the Christians were absolutely firmly against it. And, and it took until the sort of the Christianization of the Roman Empire before there started to be laws brought in that said you have to raise the children that you, um, that you give birth to. Um, and there was a kind of a two punch against the practice of infanticide. There, were, there was legislation that helped, but before Christians were ever in the in the position to actually legislate against this evil, they would tour the garbage dumps of the Roman world and save those children that were exposed and raise them in orphanages and and take care of them in in that way. Which I think is an that's very worth thinking about if we are against any moral evils in our own age there is the legislative route but there is also the compassionate route and so you know saints like macrina in the fourth century is was, just became famous for her for her deeds of of stooping down to those in the rubbish dump in order to embrace them and you think where did she get that idea from 
well, crucifixion sites were rubbish dumps, actually. <laughs> Because that's, you know, you could just cut down the body and, and let them rot. Usually that's what, that's what kind of happens. Where do you get the idea that you go to a garbage dump and stoop to embrace the weak? It's, it's Christ and it's the Christian revolution that, is, that has given us. So, so that now there is, there is the horror at doing what the ancient world took for granted. And now there is the glory of stooping service, which the ancient world thought was pitiful and weak. And I suppose, given that compassion is not a universal, even today, there are parts of the world which simply don't operate under the same principles as, as we do. Um, and yet, in the West, at least, this this idea has caught on that we should treat the least, the last, the lost with dignity, compassion, you know, uh, that, that they have a right almost, the victims and so on. We see it, you know, with the conflict in Ukraine, the way that people are going above and beyond to give hospitality and care to complete strangers and so on. Um, I suppose, again, the question is, when it comes to the, the secular person who simply says that that just is, you know, it just flows naturally from me, Glenn, what can I say? What what's your response to that? What 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 why? How are you going to say, without trying to kind of you know try and turn everything into a sort of this all leads back to Jesus or Christianity? But what what would be your beginning point for saying, where does that instinct come from? How would you kind of start that conversation with someone? I would just press into um, the two different stories we are living by, and I would just ask them which one they really want to lean into. Because the two stories we live by in the secular West are utterly contradictory. The two stories go like this. Um, we are biological survival machines clinging to an insignificant rock, hurtling through a meaningless universe to a, towards eternal extinction. And Vladimir Putin is wrong. And you're like, hang on. Let's run, run that by me again. Okay. We, we believe that the explanation, the superordinate explanation for life on planet Earth that actually explains every other explanation, the superordinate explanation for life on planet Earth is survival of the fittest, and Russia should not have invaded Ukraine. Choose. Choose. You have to pick one. And the the thing is, with, with my friends who are not Christians, of course they, they live in this realm, okay? They, they live in the realm of compassion. They, they don't live each day as though they are biological survival machines. They don't live each day as though the maximization of their survival chances is the moral metric of their lives. They live in the world that Jesus built. They, they live in the, in the world in which, of course, you stoop and serve and suffer, in which, of course... You have humanitarian ideals and you want to take in Ukrainian refugees and all this other stuff. And, and so step one, show them the disjunction between what they say they believe about ultimate reality and the way they actually live their lives. Because I think most people think, certainly most people outside the church, if you ask them, are you a person of faith? They're like, yes, no, probably not. And yet... I think we can show people that every day they are, they are living according to moral intuitions and assumptions that you cannot prove logically, mathematically, scientifically, and yet they are far more important to a person than their stated belief in atheism or whatever it is. So show them the disjunction. Show them the goodness of the, the Jesus revolution, how it has built our world, and then just invite them to keep pulling at that thread until they say, yeah, yes, the most divine thing you've ever seen is Christ the highest being sacrificed for us the lowest so that we might be ent entering into his family. That's, that's the path I'd want to take people on. Thank you again for your time today, Glenn. We're going to continue this conversation next time on science. Um, but it's, it's so interesting to, to hear, you know, the, the contrast, as I've said, between what was and what now and, and just helping people, I think, just to see the difference often is is part of that story as well in, in helping to see that the values we hold today didn't 
come down you know by accident they 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 are very different to to the ones our forebears held um we'll be back next time for more uh, from the air we breathe uh, with my guest glenn scrivener uh, until then have a good week glenn and we'll see you next time thanks see you unapologetic from premier unbelievable for more shows resources and our newsletter visit premierunbelievable.com <laughs>